If you look at 2017, with the price of Bitcoin blowing up, a lot of folks had to start paying attention to this industry. With Bitcoin, there's not this one person who is the godfather, the promoter, and we're all saying, hey, we, we're relying on you. If you look at Shiba Inu, you look at Doge, you are really are relying on the founders to go and build the infrastructure. I think folks need to stop trying to be the next Bitcoin, and they need to start thinking about how can I leverage blockchain mm -hmm. to build something that people fucking want. Yeah. All right, guys. Bang, bang. I've got Braden here with me. Uh, I thought a great place to start is uh, you are a lawyer, so you can say uh, uh, you can give legal advice to clients. Um, what's going on with crypto regulation? Like it feels the entire industry continues to ask, uh, we want regulatory clarity. We want regulatory clarity. How do you underwrite where we are right now uh, on that? Yeah, well, I have to, to begin by saying I'm not giving legal advice today um, and that my views are my own and not necessarily the views of my firm. But with that, it's we're, we're in an interesting spot. I, I think if you look at 2017, what happened with the price of Bitcoin blowing up, a lot of folks had to start paying attention to this industry. Mm -hmm. I, at that time, started a task force that was trying to educate regulators. I was at FINRA at the time as an extern in law school, mm -hmm. and I was engaged in a bunch of different investigations of ICOs, mm -hmm. right, that were coming in through the JOBS Act, mm -hmm. right, crowdfunding regulation, right, that were raising money on Republic mm -hmm. and whatnot. And if you look at where we started to where we are now, we have made progress, but a lot of the regulation that's coming down is through enforcement, mm -hmm. right? And as a market participant, you don't love that because it's hard to have any certainty mm -hmm. about what you can do and what you can't do mm -hmm. because all that you can really do is see what the SEC is deciding to yeah, bring the enforcement. enforcement actions. And so I think it's, it's difficult, but if you're somebody involved in the space right now, what you really need to be thinking about is how do I deliver value to the marketplace, mm -hmm. right? There's a lot of different coins, a lot of tokens, a lot of projects, mm -hmm. but I think you really need to think about how do I create a use case, mm -hmm. right, through this project, implement the technology, mm -hmm. right, but focus on this idea of value and mm -hmm. creating value for mm -hmm. For the community, how, how do uh, law, law firms think about uh, operating in environments where maybe it's not so clear exactly what the rules are, right? And what I mean by that is like, uh, obviously, law firms aren't going to talk to clients or even internally and say like, "Hey, we should go break the rules." But right. if you don't know what the rules are, what's like the framework? What's the conversation inside of uh, various large law firms that are trying to figure this out? I think alongside market participants, alongside regulators, like like there's a lot of different right. types of groups, but. Most people don't understand how the law firms themselves think about kind of where we are in the market. I think we we start with published guidance from the regulators. And at this point, there there are a lot of statements that have been made by the mm -hmm. SEC, by different governmental groups about, hey, we think about these sorts of products and these sorts of tokens or these sorts of issues in this way. Mm -hmm. And we start to put together a plan to help that startup or that project mm -hmm. Find out where the lines are, mm -hmm. right? Because it's it's never going to be perfect, mm -hmm. right? Right now, depending on what you're what you're trying to do, mm -hmm. but I think starting out with, hey, listen, you can't raise money to build a product product that doesn't exist mm -hmm. using investor funds and then promise a bonus of tokens, right? We learn that the hard way over and over and over again. That's mm -hmm. not going to work. So I think building your project with you know, if you can self-fund it, if you can get accredited investors to be involved and be part of the project mm -hmm. and deliver something that has value mm -hmm. and then sell that thing that has value, you want to be in that commodity space mm -hmm. um, if you, unless you want to go the, the securities route. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, if you're willing, if you have the funds to be able to just say, listen, this might be a security, let's just go that route and try to register. You know, you, you may be able to avoid some of those issues, but most startups, that's it's. A Is it a money thing? Is that why most of these uh, projects, uh, technologies, teams, whatever, are not just saying, hey, let me register as a security? So there's a couple of things. Money as a startup, as a new company is going to be a lot of what you're thinking about because it's not cheap to, to hire these mm -hmm. big firms. Um, and 
the, the issues are thorny, right? And then you think about disclosure and the burden of being a registered security with the SEC mm-hmm. and what that means in terms of ongoing governance. Mm-hmm. You, it's, it's showing your work every day, right? Mm-hmm. Everything that you're doing, everything that you're saying, you're always being asked questions. You, you ought to make sure everything you're saying is accurate. Um, it's, it's difficult to do. Every public company has issues doing it mm-hmm. with a ton of money. So you think about a startup trying to, trying to compete and play that game, um, it gets pretty, pretty hairy pretty quickly. Mm-hmm. Um, but that being said, you can do it, right? Mm-hmm. And we have seen projects that have done that. Yeah. And what is the current thought process around something like Bitcoin? Like it feels like the SEC, the CFTC, and most market participants all agree that this is not a security. Is that generally the, the kind of conclusion at the moment? So that's the other thing that's going on. So you also have this jurisdictional issue, Mm -hmm. right, between the CFTC, which from the very beginning was like, listen, crypto, they're commodities, unless they're not, Mm -hmm. right? And they fall within our jurisdiction, and it's really plain and simple. Mm -hmm. And then you have the SEC that's saying, yeah, sometimes, but we really need to be heavily involved and evaluate each one and make Mm -hmm. sure that there's, there aren't factors because the Howey test, right? It's, Mm -hmm. it's looking at investment of money, Mm -hmm. right? With this reliance on others, Mm -hmm. right? To actually build the company and and generate profits and you're expecting to profit, Mm -hmm. right? As a result of those efforts. And when you you see these promoters, a lot of times with a lot of these coins, it gets pretty tricky Mm -hmm. with Bitcoin. There's not this one person who is the, the godfather, the promoter who's saying, use Bitcoin, buy Bitcoin, and we're all saying, hey, we, we're relying on you. Mm-hmm. We're relying on you to build the infrastructure, mm-hmm. to make sure that there's continuous value in Bitcoin, mm-hmm. to make sure that you're making partnerships with mm-hmm. big companies to accept Bitcoin. Mm-hmm. With a lot of these smaller tokens, if you look at Shiba Inu, you look at Doge, you look at Musk Gold, you look at mm-hmm. a lot of these things, the The tricky aspect is that you're really are relying on the founders Mm -hmm. to go and build the infrastructure and create the value for the coin as the community. Mm -hmm. And if you're the SEC, it's a little bit tricky because you're saying, well, a lot of people did buy this token Mm -hmm. in order to make money. They wanted- It's a security. Yeah. What what percentage of the long tail of assets do you think are securities versus not? And again, uh, there's no right answer. It's just like kind of given what we know now, do you think it's like over under 50%? I think definitely under. Um, Under 50%. Yeah. Okay, wow. I would think uh, that you would have thought over. So why, why under? So I wouldn't jump to the conclusion that just because, because remember the Howey test, it, these are all factors, mm-hmm. right? If just because you have a promoter that's really active mm-hmm. and you have this, you know, this expectation of profit, that doesn't mean it's an investment contract necessarily, Okay. right? It's, it's a, you have to weigh all the different factors. So I would say under because it's really difficult to say, as an investor or somebody who buys Doge or buys, you know, one of these meme coins that there is a reasonable expectation of of profit and that that is the same kind of investment contract that you Mm -hmm. enter into when you buy stock Mm -hmm. in GME or 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 whatever. So in some way, like it's almost like it's such a joke and everyone's in on the joke that like it can't be taken seriously. It's a, it's for fun. It's a community in my, in yeah, yeah. my personal opinion, yeah, right? Yeah. This is just my view yeah. is it's about this community. And when you buy a token, you buy Doge, you buy Musk Gold, mm-hmm. you're joining this community. You're mm-hmm. saying I'm now part of this community mm-hmm. and we're all kind of in it together. Mm-hmm. Where you run into issues is where you have one or two people or five people mm-hmm. and or just the advisors mm-hmm. who make all the decisions, mm-hmm. right? They do everything and mm-hmm. everyone's relying on them to do it. That's mm-hmm. where you get into issues. Where you've seen it happen successfully is where the whole community, and that's where it's mm-hmm. powerful. That's mm-hmm. the power of crypto. Mm-hmm. That's where it's everybody sits there and scratches their head and says, wow, right? Because when you have 100,000 people in a community, mm-hmm. 200,000 people in a community, mm-hmm. all thinking about how do I create value for this token, mm-hmm. that's where it gets special. And mm-hmm. it's not, it's not, it's can't be a security at all because mm-hmm. everybody's engaged. They're all part of the process. They're mm-hmm. not relying on a promoter to do everything. Got it. And so like, 
when we see this playing out, does it come into uh, a, is it a factor if the team that created it ends up making money? Like, I understand the expectation from the audience or the the investor or the person buying the token or whatever, yeah. and they're relying on the team. But what happens if uh, the team makes money? Does that have any contribution at all? I think that's where, again, right, that's where if, if you're a regulator and you're seeing yeah. that most people got the rug pulled, yeah, right, and you see that the founders knew the right moment to mm -hmm. sell, right, and, and they made a buck and nobody else did, that becomes troublesome because, again, it makes it look like you really are in control because mm -hmm. you knew when to sell. Mm -hmm. You're an insider and you sold mm -hmm. and the other folks in the community, they look like investors. They mm -hmm. look like people who weren't fully in. They weren't fully insiders. Mm -hmm. That's why I think DAOs are really interesting. Mm -hmm. And the more decentralized that you can build these projects, even if they're not technologically decentralized, mm -hmm. Even just literally having a voting system, just old school, mm -hmm. old school, pu just putting questions out to the community. Mm -hmm. Hey, guys, what do you think? Should we do this or this or this? So this is fascinating because I think uh, I, I don't want to speak for uh, um, or, or overgeneralize all of the critiques. But I think yeah. one of the critiques that uh, has a lot of nuance to it, so it's really hard to like yeah. talk on Twitter and stuff like yeah, that, yeah. is that uh, there's a separation between like, is this uh, valuable, is this interesting, is this uh, uh, a way to interact with your customers, your partners, yeah. your community, wh whatever kind of group they fall into, uh, with this, um, I'm going to call it like democratic uh, type approach, right? So opposing a question, getting answers, yeah. then using that information to go change what you're doing. I think that like, I don't hear a lot of people being like, oh, that's dumb. Right, like right. big companies run surveys, and and, and like right. like that's a thing that has been around for a while. One of the critiques I hear that's like a, a nuanced, interesting one is like, okay, but there's a difference between saying, hey, we're going to work with the community or work with the DAO or, or survey or, or do whatever, and then saying it's like decentralized. And like you hit on this idea yeah. of like technically decentralized versus yeah. like a new type of mechanism of communicating. And I think right now, uh, I don't think there's a lot of malicious actors, is my read. But they're all getting lumped together, and the term decentralized just becomes like a marketing term. So it's like, hey, it, yeah. it's decentralized. And then they'll point and be like, because we like talk to the community and like we get information. Yeah. Right. But will regulators actually peel those apart and say like decentralization is like a technology measurement? And, yeah. and the reason why I, I separate those is like, is there like a number? Is it like – if you have three, then that's decentralized. Or is it like 30 right. or 3,000 or, you know, 3 million? Like, like right. how do you measure that? And, and I don't know, yeah. maybe we just don't know the answers yet. Well, so I think you're, you're hitting on all the right points, right? Mm -hmm. Part of, so the regulators are very interested in the definition of decentralized. And, yeah. what that means. <laughs> and partly the reason why is because promoters of coins that they've come across that's what they're saying, right? That's uh, one of the things that they, that regulators have had to field, right? Is, well, this is decentralized. And they're like, well, what does that mean, mm -hmm. right? Is it really decentralized? And you have different- How do they evaluate that as of right now or your understanding? So I think right now, the it's it's really technological, right? In okay. terms of, but It's like nodes or, or but, uh, users or something like that. But here's the issue. So let's say it is completely technologically decentralized, mm -hmm. right? It literally, on the blockchain, you have to have a certain amount of buy-in for certain things to happen mm -hmm. on the chain. And there's no one way for any individual to circumvent that or mm -hmm. change that from happening. Mm -hmm. What about the, the servers that everything's being run on? Mm -hmm. Is there any maintenance that has to happen? Who's mm -hmm. in charge of that maintenance? If you're trying to get listed on an exchange, who is the individual who contacts that exchange and says, hey, we want to get listed. Interesting. If there is a deal, right, if there's a big deal with a company, a lot of times big companies will buy huge amounts of different tokens and give them away or mm -hmm. do different promos with them or accept those tokens after buying a bunch of them. Mm -hmm. Who are they interacting with? Are they only interacting with, through the exchange to buy those tokens? Or is there someone, even if they're just a whale, right, mm -hmm. that may be enough. Right. So you have to think about that kind of stuff. If you're just a whale, you just own tons, mm -hmm. but you you own so much that you're able to actually your de facto customer service, your de facto yeah. BD. Is right. It, yeah. Is it decentralized in that situation? Yeah. And that kind of stuff, I think, is just it's tricky. And that's why yeah. I think you have to start if you love crypto and you love blockchain, mm -hmm. you love Bitcoin mm -hmm. and you want to 
develop a company in this space, you have to think about what is a real world problem? What's mm -hmm. a real world problem? You got to come back to square one. Mm -hmm. And you talk a lot about this, about mm -hmm. building shit that people want, yeah. right? You have to do that. You got to mm -hmm. start with, it's not just, it's not going to do it anymore. It's not mm -hmm. 2017. Mm -hmm. You can't just throw together a meme coin mm -hmm. and think it's going to go to the moon. Mm -hmm. That's investors do deserve more, the mm -hmm. community deserves more. Mm -hmm. So whether you're going to go the security route or whether you think you've built a commodity, mm -hmm. Bitcoin is a commodity. Mm -hmm. It's proven, right? It's it's not a meme coin, mm -hmm. right? It really does have value because there's a tremendous infrastructure by being the first major coin out, yeah. right? And so I think folks need to stop trying to be the next Bitcoin and they need to start thinking about how can I leverage blockchain mm -hmm. to build something that people fucking want? Yeah. Well, what's fascinating about it is uh, there's this weird, um, maybe dichotomy is the right word, where uh, a blockchain's entire purpose is to get to decentralization because that leads to security. Yeah. Um, there are very few things that in the legacy world uh, have decentralization or this uh, kind of robust, resilient security right. that also are efficient. Almost nothing, right. right? It's like Amazon is super centralized, hierarchical structure. Right. Like they stamp out all the bureaucracy, all of the, the kind of wastefulness, uh, and they just go for efficiency. How do we get something from point A to point B as fast as possible, as cheap as possible, and like mm -hmm. deliver value to the customer? Right. And what's fascinating about that is uh, could there be a decentralized Amazon. Like I'm unconvinced of that specific business because the whole business around efficiency and the trade-off between like high security versus high efficiency seems to be like a big question people have to make a decision on. Yeah. Bitcoin, on the other hand, is super decentralized, super secure, but plenty of cr uh, critics would argue, oh, it has a 10-minute block time or the mm -hmm. fees uh, did spike uh, uh, in past bull markets before the invention uh, and, and kind of uh, operationalization of uh, Lightning Network and things mm -hmm. like that. And so what you saw was like layer one, super secure. And if you want to be scalable, if you want to be efficient, you have to then move to these kind of upper layers. Mm -hmm. And so one of my big questions, I don't, I don't know what the answer to this is, but one of my big questions is what is the real world use case where there's a solution to a real problem that you're describing, but can still be decentralized and solve the efficiency problem? And it's like, that's asking a lot of people right. to do. And so it's fascinating because uh, it also gets at the heart of what the regulators, I think, are asking themselves, which is like decentralization is important. But there's a lot of use cases where actually probably it shouldn't be decentralized, which then leads to this whole idea of like, well, then I think people may have to register them as securities and like, how do you do that, right? Well, okay guys, you might think that OKX sounds like a new genius football formation. It's actually not. Charlie? It's your new favorite crypto trading app. You heard the man. OKX, come on! Hey, hey. There will almost, so that's why it becomes interesting to think about what does, decentral, what does decentralization mean, mm -hmm. right? Because in most cases, there will always be stakeholders. There mm -hmm. will always be people who, regardless of the general landscape, mm -hmm. are more well positioned to benefit from the project, service, company, mm -hmm. whatever it is, than others, mm -hmm. right? And I think when you talk about Bitcoin and the criticism of efficiencies in Bitcoin relative to, to other things, I don't think that that criticism is fair. Mm -hmm. I think realistically, there's always a fee to use any service. You mm -hmm. look at PayPal, they charge fees, mm -hmm. right? And so Bitcoin is mostly free, mm -hmm. but you may have to pay fees and transaction costs to actually keep the train moving. Mm -hmm. And that to me is just fair. It makes sense. Mm -hmm. I think it's almost inconceivable that you would have a product or a service mm -hmm. or a technology that was completely frictionless, mm -hmm. right? That didn't have any fees associated with yep. it because things that have value, mm -hmm. they, there's, there's something. something there, yeah, right? In your entire time in what I'll call kind of the legal regulatory part of this industry, whether it was FINRA, law firms, the whole thing, mm -hmm. was there ever a time where like somebody did something and you all just looked around the room and started laughing? Like that can't be real. Because sometimes I see things, right? And like, I'm not looking at it through the legal or the regulatory lens, but I see stuff and I'm like, that literally cannot be real. Like somebody has to be joking. Somebody has to, because there's just crazy shit that happens. And when there's like less rules, there's more uh, uh, kind of a wild, wild west uh, aspect to it. 
Is that also happening to like law firms and, and the regulatory bodies where like sometimes they're just shocked at like what somebody attempts to do? I would say that the the kinds of, of clients that approach big law firms mm -hmm. typically are a little bit more mature. They have a little bit more money. Mm -hmm. They're thinking about things in a different way, mm -hmm. right? Um, Things are obviously moving at rapid pace mm -hmm. and something that seemed insane to do, right, in mm -hmm. 2015, now you might be looking at it a little bit differently because mm -hmm. there might be new guidance in that area. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there's so many different projects mm -hmm. out there. There's literally thousands and thousands. I thought for sure we were at the end in 2018. Mm -hmm. I was like, wow, how many more projects can there be? Yep. How many more coins can can there possibly be? And, mm -hmm. and of course, it's just continued to increase. Um, and of course, there can't be value in all of them. Mm -hmm. And some of them are, I mean, is it ridiculous to just put a coin out there on the Ethereum blockchain, mm -hmm. you know, an ETH <laughs> coin and just throw it out there and tell people to buy it? Mm -hmm. I think so, right? Mm -hmm. I think you need to think about how you're generating value for mm -hmm. that end user, the person mm -hmm. who is adding that that commodity, it's not a sec always a securities thing. It's mm -hmm. just about doing the right thing and building something that's going to last, mm -hmm. right? Your if your goal is to send something to the moon for five minutes and pull the rug, mm -hmm. and maybe it'll work if you build if you send a bunch of memes out there. Mm -hmm. But if you want to build something that's going to last, mm -hmm. something like Bitcoin, something mm -hmm. like gold. Mm -hmm. You have to start with infrastructure and start with value. Yeah, it's uh, it's fascinating. What, what's your background? Like you, you have a, a pretty interesting story, and I think that most people who see your story would be like, "How do you go from where you start to inside of a major law firm and kind of on the cutting edge of these technologies and these markets and all of that?" Like, like walk me through how that happened. Yeah, so I grew up in Okotoks, Alberta, mm -hmm. a small town outside of Calgary in mm -hmm. Western Canada, about 20,000 people in my town at the time. Mm -hmm. um, not a very diverse place, mm -hmm. um, only one of like three black families mm -hmm. in, in the town. And, and so I, I dealt with a, a lot of racism, a mm -hmm. lot of bias. Um, but I think my perspective on these issues is, is colored a little bit differently because mm -hmm. I came from that environment. Mm -hmm. um, I grew up in an, abuse, an abusive household. Mm -hmm. um, things weren't g great at home. Mm -hmm. um, but, and you know, I was, I was homeless for periods of time, mm -hmm. um, lived on people's couches, right? But I think what that created was a different sense of how I ev evaluate opportunity, right? I, I look at opportunity and I think of it like a damp rag, right? And okay. opportunity and value mm -hmm. is like, is moisture, it's mm -hmm. water. Mm -hmm. And we all grow up and we're given a rag mm -hmm. and we can get more and we may be able to add moisture and add value to mm -hmm. our rag, but we don't necessarily control how we start. Mm -hmm. And I started out growing up homeless, mm -hmm. growing up in an abusive household. I was mm -hmm. homeless at 12 years old, mm -hmm. bouncing around, living on different friends' couches. Mm -hmm. There wasn't a ton of moisture in my in my rag, mm -hmm. but when things started to kind of shift for me, I wrote I, I read a book called Think and Grow Rich by oh, Napoleon yeah, Hill. One. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And like that book saved my life, mm -hmm. right? So for me, I read that book at twelve years old, mm -hmm. um, and I started to think about my life and my damp rag mm -hmm. in a different way, and it started with gratitude. Okay, it started with instead of looking at everybody else, oil is big mm -hmm. in Alberta, Canada. Mm -hmm huge. And okay. so I had a lot of friends who were very wealthy. Mm -hmm. It was odd to grow up how I did. We mm -hmm. were very, very poor. Mm -hmm. I had a lot of challenges, mm -hmm. but many of my close friends and teammates on the mm -hmm. football team and basketball team were extremely wealthy. And so it was thrown in my face, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. In a very interesting way that I don't think happens a lot in, in America, because mm -hmm. I was able to live in an area that was very wealthy, mm -hmm. but have absolutely no money at all mm -hmm. <laughs> and not actually have the, the same benefits as everybody else. Yeah. Right. And so when I started to kind of just be grateful for everything that I did have, that's when things started to really take shape for me. So mm -hmm. I got a call from a coach in North Carolina. This mm -hmm. is where things started to kind of shift for me. Mm -hmm. um, his name is Ro Russell. Mm -hmm. And he was responsible for sending a bunch of guys to the NBA. Mm -hmm. Tr Tristan Thompson, Corey Joseph, mm -hmm. right? Helped identify Andrew Wiggins. Mm -hmm. um, and me and Andrew Wiggins and a bunch of other folks mm -hmm. um, were got the call to join this school in North Carolina. What was it called? It was called Christian Faith Center mm -hmm. Academy. Mm -hmm. And 
it was for me as I was homeless at the time. <laughs> so like this was like the best opportunity ever. Yep. Right. And because I didn't have that dynamic with my parents where mm -hmm. they were going to say, hey, we got to ask all the questions about this. Mm -hmm. Hey, I don't know if this is the right thing. That wasn't the situation for me. Mm -hmm. I didn't ask my mom. Mm -hmm. I told my mom. Mm -hmm. Right. See you later. I'm going to North Carolina. Mm -hmm. We ended up there was there was a couple different <laughs> there was like a couple different apartments mm -hmm. and there were 16 of us mm -hmm. jam packed into these mm -hmm. these little apartments where it's kind of all on top of each other. Mm -hmm. Living situation. How many kids great. were at the school there? Uh, well, so there we the basketball team was like part of a separate portion of the school. Okay. Maybe there was a, a couple hundred people total in the school. OK, but, but the that's, basketball that's program. Yeah. was had like its own curriculum yeah what was it um i think tracy mcgrady went to mount zion yeah right? yeah, yeah. Right? we played against and, that school okay. we're, we're in that league so uh tracy mcgrady i think there's 12 people on the team and there was 12 kids at the school at the time and like they got in some trouble later S similar deal yeah okay. similar deal because right. <laughs> our school was type it was technically separate yeah, yeah, yeah. than the rest of the school yeah but like big picture is Roe Russell a bad guy? Yeah. No, he's not a bad guy, right? He's trying to hustle and, and squeeze his rag like everybody else is, trying yep. to give opportunities to kids. Mm -hmm. He didn't cross all of his T's and dot all of his I's. Mm -hmm. Did he get in trouble? Uh, in terms of how much trouble he actually got in, I'm not I'm not sure. Yeah. Certainly, he has remorse about how it went down. Got it. I ended up like, I ended up becoming an All-American. Mm -hmm. I ended up playing on the Canadian national team. Mm -hmm. I ended up got, getting scouted to play for you know, better prep schools that mm -hmm. were established and different mm -hmm. things. There did end up being an issue with my transcripts from that school. So I had to redo that year, mm -hmm. right? It's all water in the, under the bridge now, mm -hmm. but part of it comes down to that issue of resilience and mm -hmm. how you internalize things that happen to you. Mm -hmm. I didn't ever see myself as a victim at mm -hmm. that school, even mm -hmm. though we were literally, we got in fistfights over food, <laughs> right? Cause they would drop over, think about it. You have 16 boys, between the ages of like 13 and 19, mm -hmm. you drop off groceries once a week. Mm -hmm. What do you think kids are doing? They're storing it under their mattress, yeah, they're yeah, taking yeah. it to their room, right? Yep. The biggest kids are like, nah, man, that's all mine. Mm -hmm. And you gotta like, but I, that's how I had to come up, mm -hmm. right? And so when I think about opportunity, I see what's there when a lot of folks don't see what's there. Mm -hmm. So I saw that opportunity as my, my chance to get to a better school. Mm -hmm. So I was like, the basketball piece of this is real deal. We got mm -hmm. Andrew Wiggins here. Mm -hmm. We're playing, we played Mount Zion. And mm -hmm. I dropped a 30 piece on Mount Zion, <laughs> right? There's coaches in the stands. Yeah, yeah. I'm not going anywhere. Yep. I was like, I got this. I can yep. fight for food. Yep. I can sleep in a, in a room with four boys. I don't mm -hmm. care. Mm -hmm. I'm going to leverage this. Mm -hmm. And I did. And the next year I went to Wilbraham and Munson, mm -hmm. which is a really, really good private school outside yep. of Boston. And from there, right, got the scholarship to Kansas. Mm -hmm. And then, but you always have to be prepared for a punch in the mouth. Mm -hmm. So I signed with Kansas, which was the number one school in the country at that time. Mm -hmm. Dream come true for me. Yep. At that point, a total crazy story from homelessness to where I was in North Carolina. Yep. Now I've signed with the number one school in the country. Yep. I, everyone thought I was going to the league mm -hmm. right away. Mm -hmm. And I spend the whole summer there. Mm -hmm. And what happens? NCAA rules me a partial qualifier. Really? Because they don't accept the transcripts from that school in North Carolina. Really? Right. And so it's a big punch in the mouth. It's like, literally, I'm at the precipice of yep. everything I've ever wanted. Mm -hmm. Of course, I got to make it to the league now. Look mm -hmm. who I'm around. I'm, I'm training with Thomas Robinson. Mm -hmm. I'm then, ben McElmore was in my class. Yep, yep. All leaguers, everybody, mm -hmm. right? And so from there, it's like, well, what do I do? And I had learned, though, through my life up until that point, mm -hmm. this isn't a time to internalize my victimhood. Mm -hmm. This isn't a time for that. What do I do? They were trying to get me to go to a JUCO because mm -hmm. that's the easiest way to get people qualified. Yep. Send this the to a JUCO, come back. get them back. And I was like, as a, in terms of academically, I was a 1450 SAT. Mm -hmm. So I was like, I'm a better student than, than that. Mm -hmm. There's got to be a better way, mm -hmm. right? I'll do respect to go in the JUCO route. Mm -hmm. There's got to be a better way. And so I decided to go to Fresno State. Mm -hmm. Right. I got going there. The deal, the goal was to do like a one and done, mm -hmm. right? Two and done, what have you. Mm -hmm. Literally a month before my first season where mm -hmm. I was going to be eligible to play, mm -hmm. I break my neck in a car accident. 
Holy shit. This episode is brought to you by Eight Sleep. Good sleep is a game changer, and the Eight Sleep Pod is the best sleep machine. I sleep on it every single night. A great night of sleep allows you to be healthier, be more rested, and have more energy throughout the day. And on the brand new Eight Sleep Pod 3, you can sleep as cold as 55 degrees Fahrenheit or as hot as 110 degrees Fahrenheit. That's the secret of thermoregulation. Better sleep, better energy. Get yourself an eight sleep. You can go to eightsleep.com slash pomp today to go ahead and get $150 off your order. Eightsleep.com slash pomp. Not only do I sleep on it every night, it literally changed my life and I begged the founders to let me invest in the company. Eightsleep.com slash pomp. Go get yourself an eight sleep pod and get a better night of sleep. Yeah. C5, C6, totally yep. destroyed. Yep. They have to airlift me out of there in a helicopter. Mm-hmm. I had a 0.06% chance of making a full recovery. Wow. The the surgeon, I actually had the same neck surgeon as Peyton Manning, mm-hmm. um, Gene Carrigy. Mm-hmm. He said, if I would have taken my jacket off, if I would have t- tried to take my shirt off, mm-hmm. adjusted anything, mm-hmm. I would be a quadriplegic. Yep. Right? Because any little move, and Couldn't you learn this, if you play football growing mm-hmm. up, you learn, if you... If your neck hurts, don't move. Yeah, yeah. You lay back straight, and it doesn't matter what anybody tells you to do. Yep. You don't move. Yep. Um, but I spent a, almost a month in the hospital, lost almost 40% of my body weight, mm-hmm. had to learn how to walk again, mm-hmm. right? And this is, again, it's a punch in the mouth. As mm-hmm. soon as I clawed my way back to the to the mat again, mm-hmm. and I'm going to have a chance to play. It's at Fresno State. It's not Kansas, but it's okay. I'm mm-hmm. going to leverage this opportunity. Mm-hmm. It doesn't matter. Paul George just came out of here. I got this, <laughs> right? Yeah. But And Tyler Johnson came out mm-hmm. of there too and, and did great, former teammate. But it's all about mentality. At that mm-hmm. point, I've now broken my neck, and mm-hmm. you already know what's going on in the coaches' minds. They're mm-hmm. like, okay, I don't know if – like 0.6%. That's yeah. <laughs> tough. We yep. love you, buddy, but I think we got to start recruiting, mm-hmm. you know? And so, of course, they're thinking, I don't know what's going to happen with this guy, mm-hmm. and I don't know what's going to happen to me. It's yep. like the Friday Night Lights, Booby Miles. He's yeah, like, yeah. hey, Doc, am I going to be able to play again? Yes. It's like, I don't know, man, right? And he told me that, and I had that moment mm-hmm. where you're seeing in the doctor's eyes, mm-hmm. he's 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 not pulling your leg. He really doesn't know. Yeah. And from there, I came up with a new game plan, Mm -hmm. right? It's again, okay, so how do I leverage this opportunity? How Mm -hmm. do I leverage the opportunity? Mm -hmm. It's just the mindset Mm -hmm. of being a gravely injured, may not make a full recovery, but Mm -hmm. still on full academic scholarship as Mm -hmm. of right right now. Mm -hmm. How do I take advantage of that? Mm -hmm. And literally the only answer is, okay, right now you're still being paid. You don't get paid in dollars as a student athlete, but you get paid in education. Mm -hmm. So my goal at that moment was I want to become the highest paid college athlete of all time, (laughs) right? In education. And how do you do that? Max out credits. Mm -hmm. I took 32 credits that Mm -hmm. next semester. Mm -hmm. The next semester, another plus 30. Mm -hmm. The next semester, almost 30, 27, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? I had to write letters to the president of the university Mm -hmm. to get permission because 15 is usually the max, right? Um, But that, it's dollars. Every credit was dollars. So Mm -hmm. I graduated early. Mm -hmm. And then from there, again, if your goal is to become the highest paid basketball player in college of all time, Mm -hmm. I always wanted to go to law school. Mm -hmm. Let's make basketball pay for it. I graduated early. I had two years of of eligibility left, (laughs) right? So I'm just, I'm scheming Mm -hmm. because so many people get taken advantage of by the amateur system in the NCAA. I I was the perfect candidate for Mm -hmm. somebody to get taken advantage of. Somebody who was supposed to be this great player Mm -hmm. who gets in a terrible car accident. Mm -hmm. And now what am I going to do? Go back to Canada and sleep on my mom's couch until I'm homeless again? Mm -hmm. Right? It's like, no, I don't have that opportunity Mm -hmm. to be average Mm -hmm. or to internalize this as, wow, I'm a victim again. Can Mm -hmm. you believe it? Everything bad keeps happening to Mm -hmm. me. Everything bad did keep happening to me, Mm -hmm. but it didn't matter. Mm -hmm. Right? And so from that moment, it's again, I remember talking to my coaches at at Fresno. I was Mm -hmm. like, hey, I want to graduate early. Mm -hmm. I want to be the first person to ever play NCAA ball Mm -hmm. while in law school full time. That's awesome. And the dude, I mean, not going to name names, he laughed in my face. Yeah, yeah, And, it, like, I have to share that because it was one of the most pivotal moments for me again. Yep. When someone laughs in your face, man, mm-hmm. and, like, truly, from a position of experience, mm-hmm. thinks it's funny mm-hmm. what you think that you can achieve. Yeah, they're laughing at your ambition. <sighs> dude, it, it's testing. Yeah. And it, it, it absolutely is the measure of a human being mm-hmm. what you do next mm-hmm. and how you respond. And I was like, okay. This is going to be harder than I thought, right? 
Because if he thinks that it's that funny, mm-hmm. I have to think about objectively and pragmatically what that means. Mm-hmm. It means that it really is going to be hard because mm-hmm. no one's ever done it. Why is that? Mm-hmm. So I had to put more time and effort into my game plan to make that happen. Mm-hmm. And how I did that was I started to think about what is the value? Why would anybody let someone do that? Mm-hmm. Right? Because there's a lot of downsides. If you let someone do something that's never been done, mm-hmm. if you fail, you look stupid. Mm-hmm. You look silly. The mm-hmm. whole university, the athletic program, the you're going to say, why would you let this kid do this? Mm-hmm. Of course, it's not going to work. That's why it's never been done. Mm-hmm. Because whatever you're going to say, athletes aren't cut out for mm-hmm. law school or whatever mm-hmm. you're going to say. Yep, or, yeah, yeah. or it's too much of a burden mm-hmm. to play eight hours of basketball and be a full-time law student. Mm-hmm. It was ridiculous. Mm-hmm. It, it was truly an absurd, <laughs> um, an absurd ju- journey to, mm-hmm. to go through. Um, but... I pitched it as, well, the value in doing it is that what if I succeed? Mm -hmm. What if I, what if I do succeed? And maybe I'm the guy to do it. Mm -hmm. Right. And I had to just kind of pitch them on, listen, Seton Hall, I've been through a lot and I've overcome a lot and I don't lose. I may fail in the mean, like failure isn't going to stop me. Mm -hmm. Right. If I get punched in the mouth, I'm going to keep going and I'm not going to make you look bad. Mm-hmm. And I promise you, I'm the guy who's not going to make you look bad. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to leverage all of the possible value out mm-hmm. of this law school education and mm-hmm. being a student athlete that I possibly can to make the university look good mm-hmm. and to make myself look good and to make the basketball team look good mm-hmm. and the law school look good. Right. And you just got to take this chance on me. Mm-hmm. I'm the guy. And luckily they saw in me, they were like, listen, I don't want to get in your way, mm-hmm. right? You may be right, you may be wrong, but you seem really sure about this. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to get in your way. Mm-hmm. I, I hope it works out. Mm-hmm. And I think a lot of times in life, people are afraid to put their greatest ambitions out there. There's a lot of people who say, you know, what you do in the dark shines in the light mm-hmm. and stuff like that. I totally disagree with that. The universe works in a way that when you put out there your greatest hopes and dreams and desires and you work as hard as you possibly can, you tell others, I'll volunteer information. Here's all the things I'm doing to make this happen. I'm not asking you for anything, but are you going to get in my way? Are you going to try to stop me? Right. And that mentality, I think, is something that's missing a lot from the narrative around a lot of different issues that have to do with resilience particularly black resilience and black empowerment, that's not something that's been focused on, mm-hmm. right? So if you think about Black Lives Matter, mm-hmm. it's it's polarizing. There's mm-hmm. a lot of people who have a lot of different things to say mm-hmm. on both sides, and it it's divided a lot of people. Yeah, It's been important in terms of awareness, right? Mm-hmm. I think that's really one of the only things that it's done is driven awareness, and there's just a flip side to that coin. But without undermining what black lives matter has done let's think about what it hasn't done 64 percent of black americans in this country mm-hmm. say that black lives matter and the increased attention on on racism over the last couple of years hasn't led to any meaningful change in their life mm-hmm. which is pretty profound yeah it's pretty think. crazy stat it's like and i think it's very surprising mm-hmm. when i yeah. especially with folks that i speak to um, both sympathizers and people who have, you know, their own opinions about it. It's that's surprising. And the reason why is celebrating victimhood creates more learned helplessness, Mm -hmm. right? So when you celebrate and, and focus your attention on victimhood and pain and trauma, And you think about millions and millions of black Americans and white Americans Mm -hmm. for three years being locked in their house, watching videos of black people getting killed every day. Mm -hmm. That doesn't build up a strong narrative and a strong idea about black people as Mm -hmm. strong, powerful, capable, Mm -hmm. skilled, excellent people Mm -hmm. in our society. Mm -hmm. Right. That doesn't necessarily inure itself to the the right approach in terms of hiring, right? Mm-hmm. If you're hiring a black person because you feel sympathy or because you you know you feel guilty, that's not why <laughs> you should be hiring black people mm-hmm. or anybody in in you know in a diverse group. Mm-hmm. Right. If you think about the feminist movement and what made it really, really um, successful was 
it was the celebration of excellent women. Mm -hmm. It was excellent, excellent women who were geniuses, who were really great at what they did. And the whole world was like, wow, I need to hire a woman. Mm -hmm. Right now, mm -hmm. <laughs> right. If you're head of a company, you're it's like basically pattern recognition. Like it's the yeah. it's it's the creation of a new pattern to yeah. recognize. Right. Um, it, it, it's fascinating because I think uh, a friend of mine said this to me one time. Uh, they're immigrant, uh, and uh, we were talking about. Uh, uh, I think a report had come out. And it was all about uh, percentage of employees that were uh, born in the United States versus uh, immigrants yeah. and all stuff. And he said it to me in just like such a blunt way. He's like, I don't want to be hired because I'm an immigrant. I want to be hired because I did a great job. Yeah. And and I just was like, I've never heard anyone just explicitly say it in, in that manner. And his point was, uh, um, I, I don't want to say where he's from because it'll give it away. But like, he was like, where I'm from, no one expects them to be able to go from there to a highly successful job in tech. Mm -hmm. If I do it, maybe actually people will then say, maybe I should go find another person who's an immigrant from that place, yeah. right? And, and you create yeah. this new pattern to recognize. And in some way, like, there's a lot of patterns. Like, yeah. uh, one of the things that uh, is, like, very weird um, is, like, the autistic uh, pattern mm. of somehow in tech, uh, people are like, oh, if there's, like, an element of, like, being on the autism spectrum, uh, uh, there's value uh, that is assigned to that because of, past patterns that mm. they have identified. That's interesting. And, and so you like start to see this. And I think what you're describing is less like uh, the sympathy component and more of like, how, it takes somebody to be the first data point in the trend that then creates the pattern, which then people use to recognize over and over and over again. Right. And to enrich and, and grow yourself. Yeah. Right. So I think about the pioneer definitely benefits from being the pioneer. <laughs> absolutely. Yes. And everybody watching the pioneer yes. who came from that same environment. Yeah. I grew up not ever. I, I never saw a black doctor, a black mm -hmm. lawyer, a black mm -hmm. investor, a black entrepreneur. Just didn't mm -hmm. see it. Mm -hmm. Right. And that does a lot. That mm -hmm. does a lot to you in terms of what you think you can achieve. Mm -hmm. A lot of folks growing up in black communities see black athletes. They see mm -hmm. black entertainers. Mm -hmm. And there's no question if you ask folks in those communities, do you think you could become a rapper or an athlete? <laughs> Most people say, yeah, I could do that. Mm -hmm. Right. And but if you ask them, could you become an you know, a billion dollar investor. Do mm -hmm. you think you could create a startup that 10 X is mm -hmm. and gets, you know, listed, um, on the New York stock exchange, or do you think you could become an attorney at the biggest law firm in the world? Mm -hmm. It's a little bit like, Oh, I don't know. Right. Mm -hmm. And some of my teammates and some folks along the way have told me about my aspirations that that's white shit. Mm -hmm. That's white, mm -hmm. right? Me focusing on school, me wanting to become an attorney. Mm -hmm. That's white. I'm trying to succeed in the white world. Mm -hmm. And, that's bullshit, mm -hmm. right? Just plain and simple, that's bullshit. But that kind of narrative gets, that narrative is created from the celebration of, of victimhood mm -hmm. and the focus on it without putting the focus on folks who actually are succeeding. Because yeah. there's actually a lot of black entrepreneurs and a lot of black achievers and lawyers mm -hmm. and, and doctors. I'm, I'm fascinated with uh, Jay-Z. Uh, mainly because um, obviously he, he comes from where he comes from. His kind of early career is very well documented. Yeah. Uh, now I think is very well respected in uh, the business community and the investment community. People realize like, hey, this guy like understands what he's doing and, and they respect him for the mm -hmm. skills and, and experiences that he's acquired. Uh, but then he still will turn around and he'll use the music to basically talk about it. Yeah. Uh, and in the new DJ Khaled song, uh, he basically talks about like, he says something like, you know, uh, there's three billionaires that come from uh, kind of his uh, group of friends, um, him, Kanye, Rihanna. And then he's like, right. oh, by the way, LeBron is also a rock boy, right? So that's right. four. Right. Then he uh, explains something. He's like from Corner Boys. Uh, we're Corner Boys with Corner Offices. And this idea of like, he still has a very similar mentality yeah. of just like get up every day, work your ass off, like do the things necessary to be successful. But he's been able to transcend into like a different world. And I think that he probably more so than anyone else I've seen in music or, or entertainers or anything, uh, maybe you could put like a Michael Jordan LeBron up there as well. But mm -hmm. like Jay-Z specifically has been able to do it and then talk about it in a way that I think resonates with tons and tons of young people. And it's pretty powerful. He's a he's a perfect example yeah. right, of, of black resilience, of mm -hmm. black excellence excellence. It's, and again, it, it starts with whatever you have mm -hmm. for Jay-Z. It started with music mm -hmm. and he was a very talented musician and artist. And he leveraged that to create an empire mm -hmm. and to become a businessman, mm -hmm. right? That is really, really important mm -hmm. because for me, all that I had 
I was homeless. Mm-hmm. I literally needed basketball. Mm-hmm. It, like, it's okay. I needed yes, it. take it out. It was my ticket yes. to get an education. I yes. would never have gotten an education mm-hmm. what, without basketball, but mm-hmm. that doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. It doesn't matter now. Mm-hmm. Right, I'm an attorney at the biggest firm in the world. Doesn't matter that I that the only reason that yeah, I got. No one asks you that when you walk in the room, right? It, it doesn't matter, <laughs> right? Yeah. You're all you're in the same room as everybody else, and mm-hmm. Jay Z is a perfect example. Of yeah. That. Tell me about the book. You you wrote a book on yeah. a lot of these topics, which I think is uh, fascinating because it's not just like you understand them and uh, and kind of live your own life that way. You also took the time to write them down so that other people could read them as well. Yeah, I, I thought about how can I best leverage my story and what mm-hmm. I've been through to help other people and help mm-hmm. as many other people as, as possible. And mm-hmm. I think there's there's a lot of stories from my background and my experiences that have to do with racism and mm-hmm. overcoming bias. Mm-hmm. Some of them have to do with other things too. But black resilience is is really about celebrating and focusing on how black people in troubled environments, in you know, against all odds have become successful anyway. Mm -hmm. And it's not about saying that racism doesn't exist Mm -hmm. and that it's not a problem. It's about focusing the narrative on what we can control, Mm -hmm. right? And I think about when I break it down in terms of what I've done and what many other, you know, black successful people have done Mm -hmm. is they've taken inventory of the things that they they can control, Mm -hmm. right? Every one of those times that I told you earlier in the podcast that I got punched in the mouth, Mm -hmm. I took inventory of, okay, this happened. I can feel sorry for myself Mm -hmm. or I can start taking inventory of the things that I can actually control or Mm -hmm. influence and putting together a plan of attack to seize every single one of those. Mm -hmm. And and I think that message needs to be relayed to more people. Mm -hmm. There's too many black Americans in this country who have seen nothing Mm -hmm. but a narrative of white people preaching at white people, Mm -hmm. black people preaching at white people. If you look at most books about race and blackness, Mm -hmm. they're written to a white audience. That's crazy. Mm -hmm. Leave white people alone for a minute, Mm -hmm. right? White people need to have their own conversations. Mm -hmm. Black people need to have their own conversations. Mm -hmm. And to the extent that white and black people are having conversations, Let's not have every focus conversation be on the focus of racism and mm-hmm. making the other person feel guilty. Mm-hmm. That's not how you're going to build a bridge. Mm-hmm. That's not how you're going to build one community. Mm-hmm. Racism is an issue. How do we solve that issue? Because mm-hmm. for 30 years, all we've done is preach at white people to tell them that they're racist and it's not working. So even if you thought that that might work, it's not working. We have the data. It's not working. Mm-hmm. So. I wanted to make sure that I was putting out a message Mm -hmm. that just takes a different approach, Mm -hmm. right? It's not that I'm not going to say that it hasn't solved anything, what we've done over the last Mm -hmm. 30 years, but it's, it's certainly not carrying us over the goal line. Mm -hmm. And to me, I think focusing on the black empowerment and a huddle, Mm -hmm. right? I think about the book is really a huddle. It's a black huddle where anybody can pull up a chair, Mm -hmm. black, white, doesn't matter, pull up a chair, right? But this is a black conversation. I'm talking to black people the whole time, mm-hmm. right? And we're talking about the issues that are that are that are facing us in our communities mm-hmm. and the challenges and the obstacles that we're going to have to be, overcome, mm-hmm. and how you might be able to go about overcoming those things mm-hmm. and be grateful for the opportunities that you do have, mm-hmm. and how you might be able to leverage your career as a musician to turn that into something else. Leverage your career as an athlete to turn that into something else, mm-hmm. but. Bias is nothing but somebody else not understanding who you are. Mm -hmm. They just don't get it. They're not from that position. As somebody who's involved in Bitcoin and crypto, Mm -hmm. you know there's a ton of people who are biased against Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. They don't know really anything about it, Mm -hmm. right, except for a bunch of propaganda that they've heard. And so you say, oh, yeah, I'm Anthony Pompeiano. I'm I'm the Bitcoin guy, right? There's a lot of things that go that run through their mind about what that means. Mm -hmm. A lot of those things completely inaccurate Mm -hmm. because – they're ignorant, right? Yeah. They don't actually understand it. Education is the uh, great equalizer. Right. Yeah. And so the question, right, for you would be, well, how can I make sure that I build a bridge to more people mm-hmm. so that they're not just writing me off so that I can actually add value to mm-hmm. their lives and educate them? Mm-hmm. Is it going to be to say to every person, you're ignorant, you're biased, mm-hmm. you're a jerk? Mm-hmm. Probably won't work, mm-hmm. right? And so similarly, If somebody is biased and maybe a little racist, whether Mm -hmm. they know it or not, is the best way to build value for myself and my brand and what I'm trying to accomplish Mm -hmm. to say, you're racist, you suck, you're a jerk, 
probably not. Mm -hmm. It's about tact, right? Mm -hmm. It's about building a bridge, mm -hmm. trying to help that person understand who it is that you are, mm -hmm. right? With my professors in college and in law school, on the first day of school, I'd always give them like a little mini speech. I'd be like, listen, my name's Braden. I play basketball, but I care about this class so much. Yeah. I want to be a lawyer, right? I read X and Y studies that you did. Mm -hmm. I read your paper on Y. I'm super interested in Z. Mm -hmm. Make sure that they understand. Oh, okay. He's not like the right? other basketball players. Whatever it is <laughs> yeah. that they yeah, yeah, got yeah. going on, I just assume they have something yeah, going on. Of course. Right? Because I'm not going to let some, I'm not going to let bias mm -hmm. stop me from getting a good grade in this class. Mm -hmm. And if I have to you know, if I have to kind of swallow my pride for a moment mm -hmm. and give you a little mini speech mm -hmm. and make the first effort to get to know you, mm -hmm. I'm going to do that because yeah. my career and my life is important. Yeah, it's powerful. Know? Right? Right. Absolutely. Where can people find the book? So it's in, available almost anywhere. Mm -hmm. Amazon, Barnes & Noble, right? You can, you can find it on, through the Simon & Schuster website. Uh, if you just Google Black Resilience, Braden Anderson, you should be able to find it pretty easily. Um, and what about yourself in terms of people want to uh, to follow up with you or, or kind of discuss some of the ideas you've mentioned today? Yeah, LinkedIn is probably the best way to, to oh, get in touch with me. Yeah, a big LinkedIn guy. Uh -huh. That's how we got connected. Yeah, yeah. It's it's a great tool to to connect with like minded individuals mm -hmm. and, and people who are trying to build uh, build great things that are going to help people. Awesome, and just Braden Anderson there as well. Yep, absolutely. Awesome. I really enjoyed today. I I, uh, I, I think that. Um, uh, you have unique perspective on, on a number of different things, uh, obviously crypto regulation, but but also just kind of uh, the different points in your life. And uh, uh, I, I have often joked, but also dead serious of like we have a mental toughness uh, crisis in America, uh, probably globally. Yeah. And uh, I, I think the, uh, the the ideas that are in your book are, uh, are are quite powerful for people. And a lot of people would benefit from just uh, just hearing them. Right. You, you don't even necessarily have to embody yeah. all of them. You don't have to say, uh, yes, this is the only solution. But but I do think it's uh, it's quite powerful. So I suggest people go get it. Yeah, it's about starting the discussion, right? Yeah. It's just about having, and not everyone has to agree with every single thing in my book or everything mm -hmm. I've said today, mm -hmm. but I think it starts a conversation and it's a conversation that we need to have in this country. I love it. We'll definitely do this again and I appreciate you coming today. Awesome, man. Thanks for having me.